So I mentioned that the organic EL display saves battery power. Everything about this camera has been optimized to get better battery life. So we have the new XSpeed 4 processor, which is much more battery, uh, I guess, conservation-wise. Uh, we have the new display in there. So with the exact same battery that the 800 and the 800E use, you're getting over 300 shots per charge extra. So before, where it used to be 900, you're getting over 1,200. And I'll say that's probably a conservative number. If you're shooting one shot, putting the camera down, another shot, putting the camera down, no, then you'll probably get around 1,200 shots. But if you're shooting a little bit quicker pace, especially if you're shooting sports and actually in continuous um, uh, drive mode, I would say easily, easily 16, 1,700. I've gotten over 2,000 shots on one battery charge with this camera. So the, the more you're shooting sports-wise, the, the more battery life you're actually gonna get, which sounds a little counterintuitive, but it's actually pretty cool. And then, sir, uh, you ruining my, uh, this, this portion of my presentation, it is the exact same MBD12 battery grip. And that, for me, is, is huge. That's one of the first times we've ever been able to keep the form of the body close enough to its predecessor to actually still use that same battery grip because it has to be absolutely bang on. If there's even a couple millimeters off, which usually there is because we make um, changes and, and um, make it better ergonomics, you make those tiny little changes and now that grip won't fit on there. It won't be as secure as it needs to be. We were able to do that and you can still use that same MBD12. Awesome. All right, so that's the photo side of things. Now we're gonna get into the video side. So we're gonna go and talk a little bit more about the video features, um, how this camera builds on what the 800 did. Because the 800, it really kind of brought Nikon up to the level of, okay, I can pretty much give this to anybody out there, whether they're just gonna go and take um, tiny little shorts, whether they're gonna go and do uh, shooting as a B-roll for Dexter, doesn't matter. I'm gonna have confidence that the 800 can provide the quality that at least matches, if not outperforms, some of the other cameras on the market. With the 810, we're really building on that. So one of the first things that you'll see on it and that you'll hear about is 60p. So we can shoot 1920 by 1080 at 60p. Anybody tell me why 60p is important? Slow-mo, exactly. So we gave the, uh, this camera uh, to this uh, film, filmmaker, Preston Kanak. I don't know if any of you saw the, the, the D810 video, the Every Moment Counts. Uh, it's basically a video uh, about um, a fisherman out, out east, and the entire video was actually shot in 60p. Most of the time, that's not the case. You only use it for, for small little clips, and you're able to slow it down. But you're able to see there's no choppiness in this. And usually, especially when that bird takes off, if that wasn't shot at 60p, then you would not have been able to shoot this video the way that it was. And that's really kind of the, the, the vision that Preston had. And when we gave him the camera, when we told him all the features, we went through the, the main ones, he said, okay, I wanna be able to shoot a video with this, that it may not be cars crashing into walls, it may not be people jumping through burning buildings, but it's really gonna highlight what the camera can do and what he wouldn't have been able to do with any other camera. So obviously the first one, 60p, he was able to slow everything down, give it that, that really kind of creamy, um, emotional feel is, uh, is, is the way that he was talking about it. And even though as good as a D800 was, one of the downsides for me, and one of the things that I heard um, issues with was in certain situations, you were able to get moiré and false color, both with the 800 and the 800E. So it didn't matter, the, the image quality between the two was pretty much on par, even though one didn't have the effect of the low pass filter. With the D810, we've actually changed the way that we're processing the file, that we're processing that video. So right off the sensor, as we're uh, bringing it down to that 1920 by 1080 using the full 36 megapixels, we've changed the entire way that we're processing it. And that enables you, and I'll show you a quick example here, to pretty much make moiré or false color, uh, I'll say impossible to get, um, very, 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 very difficult to get in video. So this is a D810, and I want you to look at here, 
along the top of the building and over here. You're pretty much, you, you shouldn't be able to see any more array at all. As it jumps into the D810 right away, you can see it here. You'll be able to see it here when the video slows down. And you can actually see some choppiness in the, in the buildings as we actually, I'll go through that one more time. So you'll see that this is super smooth up here. There's absolutely nothing in the video that I could actually pick out that uh, I wouldn't want to see compared with the D800, which you can definitely see a little bit of more right there. So not only are we getting 60p, we're getting better processor in the camera that's actually dealing with the way that the camera is looking at the image and it's able to essentially get rid of any, any negative aspects of the, of the photo or the video um, that we would have normally seen. Now this for me is huge. Auto ISO. Now for, for photo people, we look at auto ISO, we go, yeah, we have Nikon, we, we know Nikon has amazing auto ISO features. Um, in my opinion, we have one of the best implementations of the auto ISO because the person using the camera can actually choose how they want auto ISO to work. They can say, okay, I'm using, a, um, uh, let's say a large zoom, let's say a 28 to 300. If using a 28 to 300 and I want the camera to automatically select my minimum shutter speed based on my focal length. So if I'm at 28 mil, the camera's gonna go, whoop, he's at 28, and it's automatically gonna go to 1 30th of a second. So it's gonna raise and lower the ISO to make sure that I keep that 1 30th of a second, which is gonna ensure that I don't introduce camera blur, uh, sh camera shake into the photo. But as soon as I zoom out to 300 mil, the camera's gonna go, whoop, I gotta be at at least 1 300th of a second to stop any shake coming in. So that's one way you can actually choose to set auto ISO. The other way is you say, all right, I'm doing uh, sports. I'm doing, let's say, the, the Rogers Cup that's starting in a, in a little while. I know that to stop not only the action of the person, the ball, but also that racket, I need at least one two thousand of a second. So you can go and tell the camera, my minimum shutter speed, don't worry about my focal length, only set it at one two thousand of a second. And it'll raise your ISO until you hit that shutter speed. So that, that for me is a very strong implementation because this isn't just in our D810. This is in our uh, D610. This is in our D7100. This is in our D3300. So every single DSLR entire category has this ability to be able to change the way the auto ISO works. So as photographers, we go, yeah, okay, we've known that for years. That's fantastic. But auto ISO in video isn't something that really jumps to mind and makes you go, yeah, okay, this is something that I absolutely need. So I'm going to show you a quick example here. Um, so you have to be obviously recording video. You have to be in manual mode, and then you get to set the max ISO. Now, the reason that it's in manual mode is so key is because when you're shooting video, sometimes you're OK uh, letting that shutter speed play with, uh, go up and down a little bit. So some people would go after priority mode and let that shutter speed walk up and down as you change different scenes. But generally, when you're shooting video, you want to lock in your depth of field. You do not want that aperture moving, and you do not want your shutter speed moving. You want it to be constant the entire time. So with this new setting, you go auto ISO control. So you're in the movie section. You're in the movie settings of the, of the um, camera menu. And then you go auto ISO control. It tells you you have to be in manual mode. And then you set it to on. And then you tell it the max sensitivity. So I'm going to show you a quick video here. This is actually uh, an excerpt from the behind the scenes of Every Moment Counts. So let me get the sound here. One of the most unique new features on the D810 is the ability to have auto ISO while we're recording live in video mode. There was a shot that we wanted to achieve where we bring our lead character out from a dark, smoky environment where he's sewing his fishing net to bring him outside into a full sunlit exterior. Prior to the D810, we would have had to use an aperture priority setting to be able to achieve that, that fisherman shot. And with the D810, we were able to put it on auto ISO and it allowed us to really smoothly pull it from a dark situation into a bright situation. And the exposure just blends really perfectly. 
So this shot he created after we told him about the auto ISO. He got so excited about it, he said, I need to uh, make a shot that I normally wouldn't have been able to do. Because he wouldn't have been, he, he said in that that he normally would have gone after priority and let the shutter speed. He told us, he's like, I wouldn't do that normally. I don't want, I want my, my variables locked in. I don't want to change my shutter speed or my aperture during a shot. That's just not the way that he shoots. So we told him this and he just absolutely lost it. So he started r playing around in the, in the studio with the camera and then came up with this shot as a way to really emphasize uh, something that you n wouldn't have been able to do without the auto ISO. Yeah. Is that his default um, It depends. It, it, uh, it, it, it depends on the scene you're shooting. If, if he's shooting just an internal shot, he probably wouldn't because then if, um, if somebody walked by in a white shirt, then it would probably raise up and down, which wouldn't look bad. But generally, if it's a, if it's a static shot, you want your exposure static. So it, it changes depending on how he's uh, shooting that particular scene. It's, it's very good. Um, it's nearly stepless to the point where I, like this is shot obviously slow-mo, uh, 60p and then he slowed it down and you can't tell any differences in the actual exposure itself. Um, we do have in the D4S and the D810 something called power aperture. So you're actually able to, when you're recording, you're able to set your uh, function in your preview button so that you press and hold the function and it will open up your iris. You go and press the, the, the preview button, it's actually going to go and close it down. The reason that that is, is a little bit more of a bigger deal than what it sounds is normally when you're, let's say you have it locked on um, live view and you ratchet the back of the command dial to change your aperture, it's going to do it in, you can change it, but uh, one third stop increments. So you guys have all done it when you're shooting live view and you actually see the and it's a visible jump in the exposure. When you're doing power aperture, it actually decreases it from one third of a stop down to one eighth of a stop. So it's a much smaller step. Can you see it if you're going to do this during recording? You can. Um, so it's not something you're going to be doing in a, in a motion picture. I would highly recommend using auto ISO over using the power aperture. But the power aperture is a pretty powerful little thing depending on how you shoot and what you're looking to do with it. The highlight weighted metering works basically as you would expect it to uh, in video mode. Um, the face detection on off that I was talking about before, that doesn't work at all in the video mode because there's a dedicated, so when you're in the um, live view of the camera and you're in the video mode and you press and hold the autofocus button on the side, when you cycle through them, you actually have the ability to change it to face detection. So if you are manually focused, so that, that does two things. That's going to um, auto-focus. So if you're sitting here and I get closer to you, it's going to see your face. And if I have it set to auto, it's automatically going to try and focus on you. But if, let's say, I'm pulling the focus myself, which is what I would try and do, it's going to use your face to meter. So there's a couple different ways you can, you can use it. Um, the face detection on-off doesn't totally translate over to the A10, but it does have a face detection exposure mode. But the highlight weighted metering works exactly as you'd expect it to. So was he using auto focus in this shot or was he using manual uh, focus? Definitely, definitely manual. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So one nice little feature with, again, the D4S and the, and the A10, uh, a lot of the features both uh, some of the some of the still, but uh, a lot on the video side, very similar between the D810 and the D4S. We've really kind of made sure that both cameras are at the top of where people expect them to be, and one of them is how it actually records audio. So I know a lot of video guys who, if you give them the option between slightly crappier video and having really good audio, or having really good video and crappy audio, they'll take the really good audio. Because you can grade, you can, you can do a lot in post to the video section that you can't do to audio. So having the ability to change what the camera is actually going to record is huge. Some guys are going to record to an external recorder, and that's, that's totally fine. Then for them, that's, this is a non-issue. 
But if you're doing more of a running gun type shoot and you're going to record either uh, a lapel mic in here, you're going to do an interview, you're going to have, uh, let's say, just an, a, an, something grabbing ambient, you're able to change the frequencies that the camera records when it comes to the audio. So if you're going to go wide, it's going to pick up the hum that we hear here. Give it a second. That you'll hear of the, uh, the air conditioning unit in the background. It's going to pick all that hum up. If you want to dial that right down, you go to voice and it's going to narrow the frequency range that it's actually going to record. And it's a sizable difference going from one to the other. What's the actual range? <sighs> That's one of those, to be totally honest, kind of annoying. I have not been able to get that, that information. Uh, it's one of those things that we, there's some information that we don't give out and unfortunately that's it. So I don't know the, the, the total range that, uh, that we go from and then what we go to. Do you know if it's a um, pass filter so it's on roll off or if it's just cut? I believe it's just cut. Yeah. Is it yes, it is menu driven. Yep, so, so w again, that same, uh, you're in the shooting menu, you go down to the movie section and then you can go down to frequency response and then you have wide or vocal. So one cool little feature that we haven't had before in any of our DSLRs is we now have zebra patterns. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm hearing some clapping. <laughs> so we have an I button on the back of the camera. It's a new info button. And by selecting that I button, you're able to go highlight display, turn it on, and then you're able to visually, obviously, off that LCD screen, be able to go and see when it is you're, you're clipping. So I love that I got claps for that. That's, that's fantastic. I know I'm in a video world when I, when I see that. Variable? No. Again, I would say yes, but I, it's one of those things that we, for whatever reason, we don't say exactly the, the level at what it's at. I would expect it to be, though. Yeah. Um, anybody do time lapses? All right, a couple people. So back in the D800-D4, so a couple years ago, well, okay, I'll go back even further. Uh, for years and years and years and years and years, and every single DSLR model that we have right now, we have what's called intervalometer built into it. So intervalometer allows you to tell the camera, I want to take 500 pictures, I want them to be 10 seconds apart, go. And then it'll go and take all of those different shots. So you then have to go and take those 500 pictures, you have to put them into an editing software, third-party software, and then you have to create that time-lapse out of it. It's a little bit on the, on the complicated side. It can get more complicated, because you can even then go and tell it, okay, in that 10 seconds, and on top of those 500 shots, I want you to take five pictures every single time. So that first shot, it's gonna go one, two, three, four, five. Another 10 seconds later, one, two, three, four, five. Another second. So then you can then go and build an HDR time lapse if you really want. It gets complicated if you really want. Um, but because you have the full 36 megapixel, at least for, for this camera, for the, the full 36 megapixel range, that's almost 8K quality. So you're able to do panning within the slideshow itself. You don't have to stay with the static, um, uh, static 36 megapixel image. You can kind of pan within it because you're going to be downgrading it to 1920 by 1080. But 36 megapixels is a heck of a lot larger than 1920 by 1080. So you have a lot of play within there, but it gets a little complicated sometimes. So starting with the D4 and the D800, 800E, we actually came up with a built-in time-lapse feature. So that means you tell the camera, very similar, but you tell it instead of how many pictures, you tell it how long you wanted to shoot for. So let's say four hours, and then you want 10 second intervals. Go. It's going to then go and create an MOV file out of the camera. Literally, you can watch it on the back of the screen as soon as it's done, press OK, and you have your time lapse that is shot out of the camera for you. Absolutely amazing. It, it'll make you shoot time lapses for no other reason than you can. <laughs> yeah, d just uh, I'm at a, a cottage with friends and we're about to make dinner. We're gonna be barbecuing and doing this and it's a whole big festival. Somebody looked at me and said, Chris, 
you can do those really cool time lapses easily now, can't you? I'm like, yes. <laughs> set it for two hours, set it to go, and then you start making time lapses just for the fun of it. It really is that easy that you're just gonna start doing time lapses. Now, the one downside to doing time lapses, if anybody's done a lot of them, is in certain situations, you're gonna find that there's very, and I say minor, I mean really minor differences in exposure between one shot and the next. And I'm not talking half a stop, I'm not talking a third of a stop, I'm not even talking an eighth of a stop, I'm talking minor, minor differences that if we were to look at the pictures, the, the, just the, the files side by side, we would not see a difference. But because we're laying them in a movie, you're gonna see a slight flickering that our eyes catch. So that's gonna look something like this. You're not gonna get it all the time. It's usually only gonna be when you're in a, um, when your light is well, basically sunset, sunrise, so when you're getting a gradient of light going from bright to dark, and if you have bright objects going through the frame, whether you have cars going through, whether you have street lamps turning on and off, if you have uh, bright planes flying by, and that is incredibly difficult to get rid of. If you're going to be shooting intervalometer-wise, so you have those 500 pictures, you can go and take those 500 pictures, put them into another third-party software, which will then go and analyze every single shot and bring it up to the same level or down to the same level to make sure that your exposure is perfect. So you can save this if you're shooting intervalometer and you wanna go and waste the time and the effort to go and do it. But that amazing built-in time lapse that you're gonna be shooting time lapses for no other reason than you can, if you shoot that built-in time lapse and you get this flicker, you're screwed because you have a movie file and the third party software doesn't have access to every individual shot. All it sees is a movie file and it's almost impossible for it to even that out. Because of that, we now have exposure smoothening both in the intervalometer side and on the built in time lapse side. So when you're in the menu of the camera, when you're telling it, I want uh, four hours worth of shooting at 10 seconds interval, blah, 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 it'll say exposure smoothening on or off. Always keep it on, in my opinion. Always, always, always keep it on. There's no downside to, to off. Or no downside to on, yeah. I have not shot a time lapse yet. Silly question. If I, if I put in those parameters, is there any indicator somewhere that will say you can't do what you're back or using? Good question, no. What about uh, storage space? Because I, I just tried this for the first time yep. about a month ago. And in the middle of it, I was like, holy shit, what if I didn't have a card space? I mean, holy poop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we're, we're not recording this, I promise. Um, it depends how you're shooting. If you're build, shooting the built-in time lapse, it's pretty small. We're talking a couple hundred megs. So when you go and do something, let's say, like this, this is, I think, a four, three, four-hour uh, exposure, and it, I maybe took, I don't know, uh, two, three hundred shots. I was on... I think half battery life, and I still had more than enough. So card space, you're not gonna have to worry about battery space. You may have to, I, I always, 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 when I go into the field knowing I'm gonna do time lapses, always have one full battery in the camera, and I try and have at least one extra depending on how many of I'm doing. If I'm doing one time lapse, one battery will, will more than, than do it, but if I'm doing a couple throughout the night, I'll have at least a couple batteries just to make sure, because you have to keep in mind, if it's warm out, you're fine, but the colder the temperature is, the more your, your battery dies off as well. Uh, you gotta... Yes, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it brings it to the point where you can't even see. Uh, you first, yeah. So it's, so it's the same as what you would normally get out of the camera. So it's an MOV, uh, H.264, and then you can choose 1920 by 1080, you can choose 720p, you can choose 60 frames, 30 frames, 24. You can change all the frame rate. And the cool thing is, it is it, so when you tell it, I want it for three hours, and I want 10 seconds apart, it'll actually tell you the exact 10.2 seconds long of a movie that you're gonna get spat out to you. Uh, as you change your frame rate from 60 to 30 to 24, you'll actually see that, that time length um, reflect the end uh, time limit of the movie. Does that make sense? In terms of the format, it's... 
No, it's it, it just like recording. It's just like recording a, a movie out of the cameras. Yeah. You, it's, it's stuck at MOV H.264. Sir, so you had a. The card slots are the same as the D800. Correct. So you have one SD card slot and you have one compact flash. So the time lapse works completely differently from the engine longer, where you're not constantly hearing like a shutter click every. You you still are. You still Yep, so, so, it's, so it's still taking individual shots at those times. Uh, the, the, the end result is instead of getting individual pictures, you're getting one movie file. Yeah, and that's one thing that I will say is that you can't get both. Some people say, okay, I want to do both at the same time. I want those individual shots for if I want to do some crazy processing and I want that MOV file spat out. No, it's either one or the other. It's either the, the hard way or the easy way. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that, <laughs> That's actually what I've done before. I've, I've done an 800 and an 800E side by side, doing one built in, one, one intervalometer just to see. Chris, for this shot here, were you, were you using aperture priority or shutter priority? Um, I would have to check. I believe I was using manual, and I was stuck at 10 seconds, and the aperture was probably f4. And you were using the auto ISO function then? Uh, no. No, so, so this, is, this is dead at night. And then, so this is probably starting at about 3 in the morning. And then when you start to see that blue come up, that's still probably 5, 6 in the morning. So that's a 10 second long exposure at 5 in the morning. So it looks like the sun's about to pop up. The sun's not going to come up for another 2 hours or so. Are you able to run auto exposure? You can, yes. And that's, to be honest, the way that I would do it. Put your auto ISO on. Um, I just really wanted to make sure that for this section, I didn't get any variation. I wanted it to be absolutely dead set at 10 seconds and no more. Yes? Uh, Mike and I have published uh, I think, uh, a list of lenses that uh, take advantage of the higher resolution sensor. Correct. Does this list still exist and some lenses drops after the, like a, for instance, uh, 24-120? Yep. Would, would, would match the new thing? I definitely would. I definitely would. Um, I, so there is going to be a sharpness increase going from the 800E to the 810, but any lens that is on the list, I would say definitely ports over to the 810. Um, that, that little bit of extra sharpness you'll get, it's not going to make any of those lenses uh, hit, the, hit the wall. There's still, still more room for, more wiggle room for them to grow with as the sensor uh, resolution gets higher. Uh, there's another question. Yeah. Do you remember what lens you used? <sighs> I'd have to look at the data because, because I, I, whenever I take time lapses, because when you go and do intervalometer, obviously you have all the sensor data from every single picture. But when you go and take an MOV file, or it gives you the MOV file, it doesn't tell you your aperture, your ISO, your shutter speed, any of that. So I always take a still image before, so I know my my sensor data. And then I take the MOV file afterwards so I can always refer back to it. Of course, I don't have that file here to tell you guys. Um, I would guess the 14 or 24. My, my guess would be the 14 or 24. I don't think I would have used a 16. It, it's, it's not super wide, so I was probably at like 20 mil. I may, might have been using the 24 to 70. I'm not sure. It would have been probably one of those two lenses, 14, 24, or the 24 to 70. Yeah. I uh, noticed you didn't uh, mention something that's very important. Uh, hmm. So the 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 um, the refresh yeah. of the of the sensor readout when you're actually looking at the view screen, especially if you're doing manual focusing, especially if you're zooming in to actually make sure it's absolutely perfect, that is a huge point. Is if you're doing a lot of manual focusing in live view, especially in low light, the 810 is a huge improvement. Not everybody uses it, but if you do. The 800E, that was one of the things that people were saying, please, just, just increase that refresh. And for the A10, it's a, it's a major, major improvement. So getting back to more of the video side of things, when you're shooting just a normal quick little video, you're not going to be doing much post to it. To be honest, you're not really worrying about the picture control that you're in. So for, for those of you who uh, picture controls, just like every other um, manufacturer out there, we have the ability to kind of set the saturation. Now we have clarity, uh, brightness, contrast, all that. And we have different settings for different reasons. So we have portrait, we have landscape, we have 
uh, vivid, we have neutral, we have standard. Now we have flat. So you can shoot flat and shoot stills, uh, still photography, that's fine. But this flat picture control is really designed for the video guys. Video guys, especially when you know you're going to be doing a lot of post to it, you're going to be doing your, your grading, this really is going to give you that slightly wider dynamic range. It's going to look, I don't want to say crappier at first, but it's going to look like nothing special. It's not going to be jumping off the page of you, but that's exactly what you want because that means that much more data is still present. You're not crushing any blacks, you're not blowing out any highlights, and that's really what the flat picture control is designed to do. And the, uh, both the D810 and the D4S, which I may have to check, uh, the D810 definitely has it. Uh, so for those video guys, it's a huge, huge, uh, big deal. Jump into picture control, go through all the different ones, jump down to flat, and you're all set. If you don't want to do any um, post-processing, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're just starting out, which one do that? Remember what I said before? Oh, I'm sorry, the, the question was, um, if, if you don't want to be doing post-processing, pro, post what should be your uh, setting? My answer is, it depends. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's on your personal preference. I like the more standard look of the camera, but I have I've actually, so we have a new, uh, who shoots and processes in Lightroom? So Lightroom has, in the options of what you can actually change your pictures, clarity. So it's not just a contrast, it's a, almost like a micro contrast. And we now have a clarity option in the D810 as well. So you can go through any of these picture controls, go through any of these picture controls, and then once you jump into them even further, you have the option to, to change them, and you can change your clarity up or down. So it depends what I'm shooting. If I'm shooting a portrait, I'm actually gonna use our portrait setting, which I've dialed down the clarity a bit, I've dialed up the sharpness a bit, and then I've bumped the saturation. I think I've bumped it down from what it should be. So that's how I've set my camera up. It really kind of depends how you like it. Um, whether you like it to kind of be more punchy. For video. Oh, well, for, for video and stills, it kind of works the same. Oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just it's, it's how you like your video to look. Sorry, Pardon? Oh, geez. Um, goodness. I, I, I bump the contrast, or the, I bump the clarity down. Because I found in playing with the new clarity option, especially with portraits, w one of the biggest things that I heard when people bought the D810, uh, Gary actually, uh, when he had the D800, he's like, there's almost too much resolution. I need, to, I need to soften up my portraits because there's almost too much detail for my subjects. I find that clarity, when you dial it down a touch, it actually helps remove any imperfections of the skin while still keeping the, the overall sharpness. No, I'm sorry, Chris. Uh, yeah. That's just in camera though, right? Yes. Yeah, so if you're showing the client, yes. they're not going to, you know. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So it's still going to be this flat when you upload it. If you're going to, yeah, so if you're not using Nikon software okay. and you're putting it to Lightroom or Aperture or, or any other place, right, it's not pulling any of our, our yeah, standard exactly. picture controls. So then if you're shooting raw, correct, it's going to put it out flat and then you can make your, your choices afterwards. Right. Uh, both. both. It really depends on what you're looking uh, It obviously changes whether you're shooting stills or video, but it really, uh, some videos, I might shoot one video and want to be really punchy. The next video, I want a kind of more subdued look. So it really depends on the look and feel of, uh, of every video and how you like it to look, to be honest. One nice little thing that we have with the 4S and the 810 is LCD calibration. I would personally recommend keeping it as it is, because I've personally found that in comparison to the older 800, even the 700 or the D3S, I found it to be much more accurate than those older cameras. But some people uh, with older cameras want their new camera to match what their old camera looks like. They're, they're used to it, that's how they want it to look. So if you have that need, you can go and adjust the LCD to have it look the same as your old cameras, but it's essentially a side-by-side -side type deal. Or you can even do it to, to match how your monitor looks if you really want. Uh, you hold the camera side-by-side, -side, and then you can actually dial it up or down using this little, uh, this little control over here. Personally, I'd recommend don't play with it, but it is there if you do have a need. Uh, one cool feature 
not so much if you're shooting a larger production. If you're shooting a larger production, you have uh, five assistants to carry your 20 lenses with you. But if you're going out there and you only want to kind of cut down on how many lenses you're bringing, you're able to go and switch just like we can with stills, live view, with that single button that I was talking about that I have my, my video, my camera set to. Press and hold this, I go from full frame to DX to 1.2 crop with one flick of the button. You can actually do that exact same thing with the D810. So I can have a 50 mil on there, and with one flip of a switch, I can go from a 50 mil point of view to a 75 mil angle of view. So you're able to essentially get two different looks out of a single lens, all while not losing image quality. You're still 1920 by 1080, still at 60p, 30, 24. Any of the settings translate completely, whether you're shooting uh, DX or FX. And again, just like with the, the still side of things, you can go and program the buttons so that as you're in live view, you can be sitting there, you go, oh, you know what, I want a 75, press that, boom. You're now in your uh, DX mode. Hot modes don't introduce any artifact in your mind? No. From, from what I've seen, I haven't done a huge amount of testing with it, but from what I've seen and what I've heard um, when the camera came out, pretty much none. Another nice little feature. Um, so when we introduced the D800 and the D800E, we had the ability of shooting uncompressed uh, video from the camera into a recorder. So if you, there's uh, different recorders out there. This one's a Ninja. Uh, we have a Ninja at the office. Anybody tell me what uncompressed video does? More data. Uh, more data, yeah. It, it, now, don't get me wrong, it's not raw by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it's it's 422 data, so it's not a complete uh, raw data set. But it's almost like shooting raw stills and JPEG, where you have, if you need it, the larger latitude to do your grading. So if you want that much larger room, the uncompressed video out will give you that ability. So with the D800, if I wanted to shoot uncompressed data to a recorder, not only was I not able to record to the internal card, I actually had to remove it. So there could not be a memory card in the camera for me to record that uncompressed video out, which was okay because that was just one little thing that people knew. All right, fine. But now you're able to not only have a memory card in here, but you're also able to be recording to that memory card and shooting that uncompressed video out. So it's almost like the, the, the photo guys, sometimes you want to shoot raw and JPEG just to make sure if the JPEG's perfect, great, you don't have to touch it. But if you have to do that extra post-processing, you have the raw file. That's what this now gives you the ability to do. Shoot uncompressed and shoot JPEG, um, well, um, H.264 MOV at the same time. As 422 output. As 422 output, yep. And one nice little thing, nice little added added benefit, is you get an HDMI cable clip. As, as, as small and as little as this sounds, it's, it's almost like shooting tethered up the, uh, in the studio when you have your USB cable in there. Over time, that USB cable tends to wiggle and fall out a little bit. Well, same happens with an HDMI cable. And I can tell you, when you're shooting video on location and you, want, you need that uncompressed video out, having that little wiggle and losing the feed and having to restart, and it's just it's such, a, such a hazard. So having that cable clip in there, pop it in there, and it locks that cable in nice and tight to make sure that you're not going to go in and lose the feed uh, halfway through the shoot. Yeah? Um, the DC power, sorry, AC power in yep. the works the same? Yes, I haven't. That's, that's the first time I've thought about that. But yeah, it's, it'll be the same unit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's the same. Um, battery. Yeah, it's the same battery, so, so it's going to work, work identically. Yes? That's a good question. Um, I don't believe so. Uh, sorry, the question was, can you buy them separately for the D800? I don't believe so. Uh, I, I can double and triple check afterwards, but I'm pretty sure I'm getting the, the, the head shake over there that, no, you can't. Um, there are third party guys out there. There's, uh, what are the jerk tether, stuff? Tether tools. T tether tools. Tether tools, there's other, other options. Um, so they have them here that if you need it for your 800 and you aren't totally sold with the, with the D810 that I've talked about today, um, then, then they do have the, the third party options right here that you can go and pick up. Jerk and jerk stoppers as well. 
And other than that, guys, I want to say thank you very much.